Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. As I reviewed Die Hard yesterday, yeah, the action blockbuster hit that launched the stardom of Bruce Willis you know, as John McClane. He was given a quasi uh, cowboy uh, personality of his. Yeah, even coming up with the phrase "Yippee motherfucker." You know, who was um, stuck uh, between the the terrorists. Um, that's led by Hans Gruber inside the Nakatomi Plaza Tower. And, and that's where the action starts, you know, on Christmas Eve. You know, where a gang of terrorists had uh, held the rest of the office executives uh, hostage. And they're trying to go on the operation for a heist, you know, to steal $640 million dollars in bonds but it was up to him to save the day <laughs> but this time it's the sequel to the surprising hits Die Hard 2 Die Harder or simply Die Hard 2 it's adapted from the Walter Raggers novel 58 minutes which has exactly the plots um, from the the novel, but but it basically differs. So. Um, this time, it's John McClane who's waiting for his wife um, Holly to land at Washington Dole's International Airport in Washington D.C. When suddenly the elite terrorists had take over the air traffic control system and not to mention you know held. Um, the entire airport hostage. So, McLean's plan was to stop the terrorists before his wife, plane, and several others uh, of the incoming flights uh, are being circled. The airport running out of fuel and and crashes, um, which is going to be pretty difficult for him because uh, he has to contain with the airport uh, security um, police officer and the military commander. Who didn't want uh, his assistance? So, yeah, yeah. This time it's directed by Randy Harlan, uh, who happens to be the same man who gave us a Nightmare on Elm Street uh, for the Dream Master. Yes, uh, the movie that starred Lisa Wilcox. Uh, but he also directed uh, Born American from 1986, which wasn't a good movie. I'll be honest. Uh, but he also directed Prison, a horror film. Um, but roughly at the same time, uh, he was working on an action comedy with uh, comedian Andrew Dice Clay called The Avengers of Ford Fairlane. Um, which, that was a film that got mostly hated on. Um, not to mention, you know, he got nominated for a Ratsy. But at that point on, he was um, chosen to work on the latest uh, Die Hard sequel, which he was trying to do his best not to replicate uh, the first movie's um, success, yet alone the the plot. Um, so, of course, this one is quite different um, from the first film. So you do get some of the same original characters, as we all know. You know, not only uh, Bruce Willis, but you get Wally Bedelia reprising her role as uh, Holly. Um, you also got William M. Afferton and reprising his role as as Richard Ford Burke. Yes, the uh, sleazy um, journalist who always wants the story, um, especially when he exposed the story to Holly. Yeah, and yeah, that's uh, one thing I I should have mentioned a little more detail here was that. Because he was the one who not only exposed to her, but he also um, exposed to uh, her kids. So, and yeah, and and then you also got Reginald Bell Johnson uh, to reprise his role as Sergeant L. Powell, um, Sergeant Al Powell. Yeah, which you know they they made contact uh, the first time around. Um, while he was in the Nakatomi Plaza trying to make contact with him, you know, giving that uh, 
cowboy personality and try to explain what's going on. And also the fact that the character was was very smart too. So, and um, so those are the characters that we all know from. Uh, but we did get new characters this time. Um, now we have a new villain um, named Colonel Stewart, uh, who was played by William Sadler. He's joined in by um, by a General Roman Esperanza, who's played by Franco Nero, and they hired a team of elite terrorists to take over. Which, interesting enough, he actually had supporting the cast, which includes John Leguizamo in a very small role, and Robert Patrick long before, uh, which is a year later. Uh, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Yeah, I forgot that he was in Die Hard 2 before. Um, and of course you got Dennis Franz. Um, yeah, long before NYPD Blue, but he was just uh, in the short-lived series um, called Nasty Boys, uh, which aired on NBC. It's from the same producer that would later went on to do the long-running series Law & Order, uh, Dick Wolf. Um, also, uh, Dennis Franz was previously in those um, Brian De Palma films like Blowout and among others. Um, yeah, you even got John Amos uh, from Good Times, uh, best known for playing the James Evans Sr. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty interesting they got him. Um, and Fred uh, and the late great uh, Fred Dalton uh, Thompson you know, who's, who plays the air traffic flight director, yeah, Ed Trudeau, um, who's, who's, all, who's been best known for for being a, uh, a politician, a communist, a columnist, and, and an attorney as well, but, but he is an actor, and he's all, and he was a senator, um, but he has been in movies like Marie, and Baby's Day Out, among others, yeah, so he's, no longer with us. Um, and there's several others uh, falling in. And I, I would definitely say it's an excellent sequel uh, to the first one. I mean, it, at least they were going for something different this time, so I know this is exactly what the plot lies on. You know, where terrorists, you know, takes over, and which also leads to sometimes, you know, taking over the, the plane, which I know other films have followed. And not to mention, uh, this was very notorious for the TV version that came out. Uh, now, yes, if um, now if you saw the, the movie on CBS originally, which would later be played in syndication such as TBS and uh, even other stations that carried it, uh, yes, they, because you know Die Hard had a lot of uh, swearing and cursing, just like all the other Die Hard films did. I mean, of course, they're, they're going to always dub their words. Um, like, for example, uh, I got two words for you that Colonel Stewart says. Joke in you. Or, <laughs> or um, McLean saying the, well, I got two two words for you. For the uh, <laughs> the reporter um, says, "Joke off," and and the most of yeah, the most of them all, because he does uh, his famous uh, you know catchphrase um, that's often said on all five of these movies. Uh, but they dubbed it this time by saying, "Yippee ki yay, Mr. Falcon," <laughs> and. I know, it, it just doesn't make any sense, but I, I understand because when they had to play this on network television and all that, of course, you know, they're trying their best not to leave out the, the harsh words. I mean, usually they'll just edit them out. I mean, it would have been nice if they had left the cut in the, for the Blu-ray release, so now you have two cuts, uh, the, <laughs> the TV version and the original one. And yes, this one actually had more features uh, this time around compared to the the first movie, which should have had added a little more. I, I even admit that they could have added more too. Like they could have added 
uh, some more interviews and stuff and and all that. Um, but this time they really did actually had a featurette. So they actually had one from HBO First Look. Um, I wish it actually had more uh, TV spots because there were several others that should have been included. Um, they actually have one TV spot for the movie that's in black and white, so for create not in good shape. I don't know how on earth the Fox had to deal with that, but they could have added more. Um, but they had the trailers included, so that's good to know. Even the teasers, especially the one that that I saw um, on home video releases, and um, they they even had um, other stuff too included. Um, they even had some special effects that were done by OM so they they pitched in to help and had some tons of action scenes and I'm gonna get to that too when when we get to the review and yes um, I did saw this movie at the drive-in as a double feature with The Exorcist uh, Free back um, when I was five years old oh, when, I, when my when my family went to go to um, to Ban Nuys uh, to go see the film. Yeah, it was at the Ban Nuys Drive-In Feeder that was operated by Pacific Feeders. Um, yeah, this was a feeder that I went to go see the first Mission Impossible. Uh, not to mention, I went to see um, Independence Day twice. I mean, first time at the at Man Feeders in Glendale, but then next I saw it again. Uh, double feature with Chain Reaction. <laughs> yeah. And I even saw um, other movies over there too before the theater closed down and became a school. So, but that's where I saw the movie, and it was fun. Okay, so let, let's get to the review because I'm taking several of my time. Anyway, it stars Bruce Willis, Bonnie Bedelia, William Atherton, Reginald Bell Johnson, Franco Nero, William Sadler who of course went on to do um, the movie Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Right, he played uh, the Grim Reaper, uh, from what I remember. He also went on to do the movie Rocket Man. No, not the new Rocket Man. No, this, this is the one with, um, which was a, a comedy that was uh, with uh, Harlan Williams, yeah, who becomes the astronaut. Yeah, yeah, that actor. And he was also in the movie Solo. No, not the other Solo. You know, Star Wars story. No, Solo with Mario Van Peebles. Okay. <laughs> yeah, John Amos from Good Times, uh, but he's been in other films, such as uh, Coming to America with Eddie Murphy and Arsenio uh, Hall. Dennis Franz. Um, Art Evans, uh, who was actually in a uh, short-lived TV series, uh, 9 to 5. Um, but he's been in other films. Uh, Fred... The Dalton Thompson, um, who covers the show, Tom Bauer, uh, Sheila McCarthy, um, yeah, Robert Patrick, John Licozambo, Don Harvey, Kamini, yes, Kamini, uh, who went on to do uh, Star Trek uh, Deep Space Nine, but he was also in Star Trek The Next Generation. He's a British actor, he's been in other works too. And Robert Costanzo, yeah, which I know he's been in a lot of stuff. It's uh, written by Stephen E. D'Souza, along with Doug Richardson. Yeah, based on the novel, 58 minutes, uh, with the characters uh, based on Nothing Lasts Forever. And it's directed by Rennie Harlan. And I know he later went on to direct uh, movies like Cliffhanger with Sylvester Stallone. And he did the ginormous flop um, Cuffwood Island with um, Gina Davis which happened to be uh, his wife at the time and, but he later teamed up with her in the movie A Long Kiss Goodnight which that's a better film but nevertheless <laughs> the movie began set on Christmas Eve in 1990 which was two years after the Nakatomi Plaza Tower incident in 1988 you know with Hans Gruber taking over the uh, high situation, Brian and his team, and and we meet John McClane, who's the NYPD officer, you know, up to save the day. But he now works for the LAPD, who's just waiting for his wife Holly to arrive from Los Angeles um, 
and waiting for her at the Washington Dole's International Airport so that way they get to spend Christmas time with their in-laws. Yeah, unfortunately though, um, his uh, in-laws uh, car is being towed away by Sergeant Beto Lorenzo who happens to be the brother of airport uh, police captain you know, Carmen Lorenzo and he's which is of course played by uh, Dennis Franz and Beto of course is played by Robert Costanzo yeah. well anyway um, we do meet uh, the sleazy reporter who always likes to expose stories you know played by William Everson, you know, as uh, Dick Richard Formberg, who, who actually was responsible for exposing Holly's identity to Gruber in the Nakatomi Plaza. Yeah, actually exposing her, even the exposing the, her kids too. So that explains why he had to punch him in the face. So he's being assigned a seat across the aisle from her. Uh, which I know the stewardess uh, totally did not get along with him. Yes, I mean I don't blame him. I mean because they call because he is a jerk for what he did. I mean they didn't like his stories or anything else. I mean everyone started to feel a little nervous too. Surprisingly enough, Holly was actually sitting next to an old lady who brought in a taser. So in case if she gets mugged, uh, interesting enough, uh, there was actually a magazine on the back where it actually shows a, uh, a still shot of of another action the franchise with comedy elements of course um, Lethal Weapon or at this rate this was got to be Lethal Weapon 2 that they show there because interestingly enough I mean both of these films were produced by Joel Silver the yeah, head of uh, Silver Pictures well anyway in the airport bar, McLean suddenly spots two men in army fatigues behaving very suspiciously and pursues them straight into the baggage area. Yeah, they had like a violent shootout and and he actually took out uh, one of the, the golf clubs and, and whacked them and you know, beat the shit out of them and then later shot uh, that one guy while the other guy who's black um, escapes. And going directly to Colonel William Stewart, who's played by uh, William Sadler, who happens to be a former U.S. Special Forces, who's working with other former members of his unit to establish a base in a small church that's right near the airport. They just killed and shot down a priest, which he dies in a very awkward situation. You know, he lands straight into the benches and dies like this land in this heart and they hacked into the air traffic control systems with several communications with the planes deactivated the runway lights leaving Dole's ATC powerless to land aircraft and their plan was to actually rescue a drug lord and dictator of Bel Bader named General Raymond Esperanza who's played by Franco Nero um, because um, he was about to stand trial on drug trafficking charges um, by going straight to the United States. They demanded a, a Boeing 747 cargo plane so they can escape with another country with him together in tow and actually wanted the airport controllers not to try to restore the controls and plus they also wanted their planes to, to land in circles around Washington DC so by then, you know, they'd be running out of fuel, and then what's worse, they'll crash. And McLean was about to warn um, everyone that Holly was actually in one of those planes. So, especially when he had to relate the situation to the airport police captain, Carmen Lorenzo, yes, Dennis Franz, who, who is a complete asshole at times. I mean, he's not getting along with McLean and refused to to uh, help him with assistance especially because you know he's the one responsible for the uh, incident that happened so anyway but he did learn that the dead man that he shot was actually an American soldier that was believed to be killed in action while originally serving in Honduras so they had to, to uh, 
take out those fingerprints that <laughs> that he that McLean had to take and and send it a fax to um, Sergeant L. Porel, who's played by Reginald Vell Johnson, has a small role, but at least it's good enough for him to join in to to find out what's going on here. You know, trying to get the fingerprints and information on him. I know William Stewart actually had a moment too where he actually did some exercise um, in full nude <laughs> while I was watching the report. So, okay. Um, anyway, then McLean had prepared to fight the terrorists by allowing himself uh, with a janitor named Marvin, who's played by Tom Bauer, to try to gain some large access uh, to the airport. You know, like going straight to the air bins, for instance. Yeah, kind of like it's similar to uh, the scene in the original Die Hard. You know, you know. Remember that line that he said, which I forgot to say in, in my review, where I say, "Let's get together, have a, have some drinks, had a few laughs, that sort of thing." Yeah, that that was a funny moment. But anyway, um. Those communication director Leslie Barnes, played by uh, Art Evans, um, who heads um, to the unfinished antenna array, joining in with a SWAT team that Lorenzo had sent, only to be bumped into um, Stewart's um, elite terrorists. Uh, one of them is led by Robert Patrick, um, which then at that point on, uh, McLean had arrived from the vents and actually shot him down along with the rest of the other ones and they killed all of his henchmen completely but the SWAT team was being killed too by ensuring the fire flight. So McLean rescues Barnes, kills um, the rest of the of Stewart's men um, and then suddenly the antenna explodes which Stewart had uh, recuperating the instrument landing system and, and impersonates air traffic controls to crash um, a British um, jetliner, killing everyone on board, and that happens to be um, the pilot of the Windsor Airlines flight um, that's played by uh, Calm Meany. So, yeah. So I know uh, McLean was trying to help, um, telling them to actually you know, go up uh, up on the air, don't don't let this happen, but it was too late. So, then um, the U.S. Army Special Forces team um, had arrived, um, that's led by Major Grant, who's played by John Amos. Um, yeah, which this is a guy who at times you thought that he would be, you know, either the hero, he'll be like another hero, or he's just going to end up being a villain. Yeah, I mean, his character keeps changing a few times. Um, and yes, he even says the line, You're in the wrong place, and you're in the wrong situation at the wrong place at the wrong time. And yes, even McLean says, Well, it's the story of my life. <laughs> okay, so they were listening onto a two ray radio that's being dropped by one of Stewart's henchmen, because uh, he also did spot a radio too before. And McLean finds out that Esperanza had killed his captors and now is the pilot of the plane carrying them to Dole's and wants up landing, which then this is where we had that most famous scene of them all that's right up there uh, with the scene in the first movie, you know, where he, where McLean jumps up, you know, wrapping around with the fire hose on top of the tower of the Nakatomi Plaza. And he swings around to the next floor and, and just shoots down the window so he can enter. Yeah. There's a scene where he winds up inside the plane. Yeah, and and Colonel uh, Stewart, along with his men, were shooting him down. And then next thing you know, they sent out some grenades. They throw it into the plane. And that's when he went straight into the ejection seat, you know, where he just puts his seatbelt on and launches the ejection seat and suddenly he goes all the way up on the air and this was actually done by Alouem by the way to actually create that particular scene using those blue screen effects uh, where you see the explosion of the plane and then you see a close-up all the way straight straight up and it flies around 
of McLean, you know, just saying, Oh shit! Like, uh, you know, like grunting like that. Uh, that that's got to be such an amazing shot <laughs> right there. And yes, uh, Stewart says, You lucky fuck, when the parachute uh, <laughs> had uh, pulled up and, and McLean landed. <laughs> Because, yeah, he was in the cockpit, too. <laughs> okay. Uh, but there's also another action scene that's so memorable. was when he, he, he arrived um, along with um, Major Grant and and even joins in the, with um, Barnes and, and the rest to go after the rest of, of the terrorists uh, in the church. So then that's where we have uh, that snowmobile chase scene going around. Uh, so, yeah, McLean was on one of them as he killed one and, and then goes around on a violent uh, shootout with the rest of the other terrorists and stuff until Stewart suddenly shoots him down. Just before the Big Rich shows up, um, almost hitting the, the snowmobile as um, McLean was riding on, and then he jumps off and, and then the snowmobile explodes. I mean, wow. Amazing stunt. Um, of course, uh, Grant uh, joins in with his team to to raid the location, you know, shooting them down. But then next thing you know, yes, we did learn that uh, even for this operation, that this was part of the plan. So that way he'll join in uh, with the rest of Esperanza and Stewart. So, yeah, he was a traitor. Because he's the one who actually taught Stewart how to do all this stuff. So next thing you know, um, McLean demands Wenzel to ex intercept the uh, Boeing 747, which all the mercenaries out there are, are going to escape. But he refused to listen until McLean fires at the captain with a blank gun, just proving his story about what's happening. And just on the board with with Holly's flight, yeah, that's when the Dick suddenly uh, went straight to the bathroom. He took a payphone because he brought in his uh, camera crew to actually record the situation that's happening. You know, we hear the announcement of of terrorists uh, going on board at the airport, and that's where it becomes uh, his next story, um, which winds up on the air, on the news. Uh, uh, and of course, before that actually happened. Um, he actually saw a clip of an episode of The Simpsons, so, uh, which was the episode where you know, you know, Homer wanted to bring his family to get together, and you know, they went to that uh, that place where they were actually using the those machines that that can shock them. Yeah, you know that episode. Um, but yeah, he was making contact with them. You know, just announcing that there is going to be a terrorism going around and then next thing you know Holly came directly to the bathroom takes the the taser and just shocks him <laughs> and just says amen to that dick yeah so yes uh, the steward has actually helped her out and so then uh, this they later took um, <laughs> dick uh, already unconscious from from the shock that he was given so he's already feeling the bulge. Next we know, um, McLean would later hitch a ride on a news um, helicopter, yeah, which we had the reporter um, Samantha Sam Coleman, played by Sheila McCarthy, which I know he met um, earlier too, because um, he was give she was giving a, a report, um, you know, for uh, McLean as well as giving a report for Stewart and all. Yeah, she was desperate, but anyway. Um, he drops off of the rain, on the rain of the Taxi Mercenary 747, um, which then jams on the left inboard alteration with his jacket, preventing the plane from taking off. And that's, of course, when Grant shows up and, and actually fought uh, McLean completely. And he even says, you know, you know, I already have friends. He actually knocks him out of the wing and falls straight into the engine. Yeah, all the blood starts to rush, too. And then next thing you know, um, Stewart had arrived and was beating the shit out of him. Yeah, kicking him in the face. Yeah, just like how uh, Kyle kicked him in the face um, in the scene, in the construction scene of, of the first Die Hard. And, 
And yes, he even says, Bon voyage! Happy landings, asshole! Yeah, just when McLean just uh, sets off uh, the gas ball from the plane, and he falls all the way down, and next thing you know, he brought in the lighter, and that's where he says the most famous line of them all, yippee ki motherfucker! And then he throws the lighter straight into uh, the gas, and it goes all the way up from the snow, and straight up to the gas ball of the plane, and explodes completely. <laughs> And that's where he, you know, he just screams and he just yells and then he says, Holly! Here's your fucking landing light! <laughs> yeah. So now, um, Holly finally arrives in the plane. You know, just when the plane finally landed safely as they could. You know, and yes, even Dick joins in too. And, and the old lady even calls him an asshole. telling him to help him out. But nevertheless, um, McLean finally came and and he finally gets to see Holly again. You know, just getting ready to spend her time, you know, for Christmas. And um, of course, we did learn that yes, he had a ticket um, for parking in the wrong area. You know, trying to get to the terminal. But you know, well, surprisingly, uh, Lorenzo turned out to be very nice again. So it's good to know. And I, I know he also introduced his brother because his brother often shows up in several scenes. Yeah. So seeing this Christmas, you know, everything's going great. So there you go. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I really did enjoy the sequel too. I think this was as excellent as it can get. I mean, yes, I, I know uh, Willis had changed a bit of his personality this time. You know, he's not worried about his safety. But I think what's what he's really worried about is actually you know, is his wife, you know, who soon she'll be dead if, if this happens, and we don't want that to happen. But he's he's just trying to help, you know. He's trying to stop these terrorists from taking over, uh, no matter what he's doing. So I mean, I mean that's for all the crazy situations he's in. Well, <laughs> that is part of the story of his life, but. Nevertheless, he still has the charm, even if it had to change a little bit. But I, I don't blame him, man. I mean, because, you know, we had to deal with uh, Carmen Lorenzo, you know, being an asshole to him and the way he's treating him, not even letting him know everyone that that they're taking over and they're, and they're trying to, they're trying to, you know, bring in their, their drug lord to back um, on the plane so that way they'll go to another country so they'll continue to do their their mission you know terrorism are always taking over everything um so but on on top of that it de definitely had more special effects that they put into it a lot of great action scenes I, as i just mentioned um when i got to the review um yes um they did some amazing stunt work uh, I know uh, Willis wanted to do his own stunts, which he did at times. Um, he brought in a stunt, uh, a stunt coordinator. Uh, he did. They did brought in a stunt coordinator to actually, uh, you know, practice all the the stunt work that he has to do, especially in the baggage area or the snowmobile scenes, or most of all the the uh, ejection seat scene, and that's just amazing. And I know. Um, you know, Randy Harlan didn't want to replica the scenes from the first movie, but he wants to keep it straightforward here. Um, and I, I thought he did an excellent job with his direction uh, as a takeover to John McTiernan, which he will return in the third film, too. And also the fact that this is a Christmas movie, too, you know, just like the first film, you know. I mean, you still get to hear uh, the song, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow at the end of the movie um, so that you can see the similar vibes and um, you do hear some Christmas music here and there but not as much I guess you could say McLean did have change his character a bit because you know now he's just trying to uh, deal with with the situation before you know because after all he still remembers uh, what happened in the past where he says how could the same man happen on the same situation twice so of course it's gonna happen Especially on the 
on Christmas Eve, so. And yes, I mean, even Holly says the same thing. Why does it keep happening to us? I mean, why does it always have to happen? Well, for obvious reasons, I guess. Um, uh, but it has a great cast, too, of course. Um, all together, um, they did, did a great job, and love the way it turns out, and, and it's a very uh, entertaining story. I mean, and I can see why, you know, a lot of, uh, there are critics out there who either liked it more, or they probably liked it a little less. It's nice that Gene Siskel loved this movie so much that he put it on his best list. I mean, he definitely loves the first movie, too. Uh, no doubt, but Roger Ebert, on the other hand, was another story because he gave a mixed review for the first Die Hard, mostly because the cops that's being portrayed in the film were idiots. Well, no doubt in question, but that's not a main reason to <laughs> give this a, a mixed review for that alone. But I still think it's the best movie ever made, per se, and s still is. But this sequel, on the other hand, is is excellent, and I think it's right up there with the first film, and it works well as a Christmas movie too. I mean, especially when you got a, another villain this time that you love to hate, and the way William Sadler played that role is exactly what I expected. So. And and it's great to see John McClane back uh, back in action, you know, taking down those terrorists and everyone, all these bad guys. So. And he still has the likeness of him, still has the charms, I mean, even even if he kind of loses that boundary. Um, yes, there's even a moment where he actually bit off uh, Stewart, you know, during that fight scene. I mean, that was like really gruesome here. To uh, you know, bite his hand off and spit out the a piece of uh, skin. <laughs> I mean, wow. That also proves how crazy he is. Oh, and I also noticed they had like several locations that they had to shoot uh, during those particular scenes, even though the movie was set in Washington D.C. So they had to use them in several locations nationwide. And I'm like, wow, I never knew they could definitely shoot scenes like that, even though it, it's all supposed to take place. But, but hey, nevertheless. But anyway, um, it's a true excellent sequel to the first, and I really love it. And like both, and like the first film, it classifies as a Christmas movie. So there you go. So that's Die Hard 2, Die Harder, and I give the movie five stars. Like the first film. <laughs> I'm Joseph A. Sabora. Have a happy and safe Merry Christmas. And yippee ki motherfucker. <laughs>